We'll get on with the program. I am so excited to have you all become more aware um, of the history and the legacy of Admiral Rickover. And you will hear it through the panelists who work directly with him, most of them themselves with a science background other than Dr. Cook, who was a submariner who then went to Yale Medical School. Um, otherwise, Bill Becklin is here, and I went to him. He is a charter member, one of the original on our board that Admiral Rickover personally wanted to be a member. Um, so enjoy this panel. I turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, well, I uh, heard a lot this morning from uh, Nobel uh, Prize winners and uh, young entrepreneurs. I'm going to take you back uh, 60 years. It's time for the gray hairs here. Uh, we've got a panel composed of uh, four, four people here that uh, all dealt directly at one time or another with the Admiral. And uh, I know that most of you here that have gone through the uh, RSI program uh, call yourself Rickoids. And I'm, I know that you know that's because of Admiral Rickover's influence on this whole program. He and Joanne started this thing in 1983, and it's gone on for 35 years, which is what this reunion is all about. Uh, and I think it's important for you, although you're called Rickoids, I don't know how much you actually know about the Admiral. So the point of this panel is to make you a little more familiar with what the Admiral did, how he operated. Uh, and in fact, I would suggest that I'm going to take you back 60 years to what I call the original center of excellence. <laughs> I see excellence all over this place, right there on the sign. It's the Center for Excellence in Education. If there's one thing the Admiral ever stood for, it was excellence. And his organization, known as Naval Reactors, got started in the 1940s. We're all from the vintage 1950s, early 1960s, kind of 10 years into the program. Uh, it's too bad that the original key people in this program aren't here, uh, but most have passed at this point. Uh, but uh, we'd like to reflect on our experience with the Admiral. Uh, he, talk about excellence, the Admiral personally selected everybody that came to work for him at Naval Reactors. And he also, throughout his career, personally interviewed and selected every officer that went into the nuclear program. So, and he picked the very best people, and he put pressure on the very best people, and they all performed, which is why the nuclear Navy has become as successful as it has been. And hopefully, uh, you know, part of what the Admiral delivered to all of us, and through his influence to you people that have come through RSI, will carry on. I think Bill Givens yesterday morning made a really pertinent observation, and that is talk about influence. The Admiral not only influenced the people that came in direct contact to him, but we all, through his influence, have influenced people that we have dealt with. And I think it's important for you, Rick Hoyts, hopefully to go do the same thing. So let us talk a little bit today about what Rickover was like. I've got uh, four people here. Two of, uh, two of them uh, worked directly for the Admiral, and two of them were uh, uh, nuclear submarine commanders. On my left is uh, Tip Rolin. Uh, Tip worked for Naval Reactors for 15 years, reported directly to the Admiral for seven years with responsibility for NR-1, uh, the Navy's deep submergent submarine, and the Los Angeles class, 688 class, uh, attack submarines. After NR, he worked for private industry and the Department of Energy. Uh, Jack Cook is a retired Navy commander. He served in a variety of nuclear-powered submarines, including command of a fleet ballistic missile submarine. After leaving the Navy, he went to medical school and then practiced internal medicine for 41 years. Mario Fiore 
As a retired Navy captain, also served in a variety of nuclear submarines, including command of a nuclear attack submarine. He was a submarine squadron commander and in his final Navy position, commanding officer of the Naval Underwater Systems Center. Following his retirement from the Navy, he held senior positions in the Department of the Army and the Department of Energy. When he was assigned to the White House in 1983, he arranged some of the earliest financial support for Center for Excellence in Education. Peter Van Noort, uh, last person on the end, worked for Naval Reactors for 10 years, reported directly to the Admiral for five years, with responsibility for educating, training, and qualifying personnel to operate nuclear power plants, and finally, uh, managing the training and research prototype in Windsor, Connecticut. After naval reactors, he worked in the civilian nuclear power and other heavy industries in executive positions. What we're going to talk about today really is uh, three areas. The Admiral's impact on technology and engineering, his impact on the way people work in organizations, and the importance that he attached to excellence and education. And we're going to start with Tip. Uh, Tip, you've spent most of your career managing large projects and research and development programs. What are the lessons that you learned from your time working for the Admiral have been most valuable to you? Uh, I want to start with a statement that the Admiral made uh, usually at his periodic staff meetings, which is, what I'm about to say is applicable to you, not the person sitting on your left or right. That usually got people's attention, and it was absolutely true. The Admiral was, and I worked in industry and government and, and for Princeton University, and uh, the Admiral was a management genius. I've never seen anyone close to him in his ability to manage people and projects, if you will, programs. So I'm going to give you a few of the pearls that we learn from him, sometimes uh, by directly, so, sometimes by experience, by doing the wrong thing and him correcting us, sometimes by direct teaching. For example, tell the truth. We had several Nobel Prize winning scientists here this morning. They know, and they mention, you don't get anywhere without telling you the truth in science. The same thing is true in the long run in business or any technical field. Mother Nature doesn't understand obfuscation. They don't understand spin. That's not for us. We have to tell the truth. And when you're the boss, you have to tell the truth to your people or they won't get the right message. Always know who is responsible. You're in a meeting. People love to have meetings. The larger the organization, the more meetings they have. Okay, you sit around in a meeting, people talk a lot, and then they go off and to their next meeting. But it's only good if you decide what to do and who's going to do it, and ideally when it's going to be done. So the Admiral's favorite thing was to go in a group of people, usually a mixture of uh, say on the NR1, it was me and contractors. And, and when we'd finish the meeting, he'd say, uh, particularly if there'd been a problem brought up, say, okay, who is responsible? Who? Not what organization, who? <laughs> Immediately, people would shrink in their chairs, become half their normal size. <laughs> you could see it happening. So you need to know that. That's extraordinarily important. Document agreements. Some of these sounds like, sound like the things you'd do on a to-do list. Not so. These are very important, no matter whether you're the boss or the underboss or a researcher. You need to know these things, or you will not succeed. So we had to document agreements. We're in a meeting with a contractor. At the end of the meeting, You'd hand write, in those days people actually used pencils, and you would hand write 
the agreements and commitments from the meeting. This was a requirement before you left. I never, I, I did that probably hundreds of times. It was always different than what people thought they had said during the meeting. When you write it down and you have to read it and put your name to it, then it becomes clear. Uh, the Admiral had a saying, good news weakens me. That was referred to in one of the, <laughs> the other panels. I used to tell my people the same thing. I can't do anything about good news, you know, except it's nice. <laughs> but bad news is something you can apply yourself to resolving, solving the problem. That was his philosophy. Don't shoot the messenger. It's, that's very important. It's too often nowadays, particularly in politics, uh, someone brings you bad news and you kick them out of the room or, or you, they get blamed for bringing you the bad news. Well, of course, they won't want to bring you the bad news the next time. And you need bad news if you're going to do something about it. So don't shoot the messenger. He never did. If you'd go to him and say, Admiral, this happened or that happened. Here's what I'm doing about it. Doesn't have to be specific, just you know, sufficient so that he knows you're solving the problem or approaching a solution to the problem. That was enough. He never criticized people for bringing him bad news. If you don't bring him the bad news and someone else has brought him the bad news, you may have a problem. Minimize office politics. Office politics is a poison. And having worked, as I say, in academia to a degree, in industry and government, uh, office politics is a particular problem in government and academia. Uh, it's also a problem in industry, but there's certain motivating forces in industry which tend to minimize it. There was no office politics at naval reactors, mm -hmm. and it was because of the admiral. We knew who was in charge. We were devoted to solving, to, to providing the fleet with the best possible nuclear propulsion plants and submarines and surface ships. That was our dedication, not to whether we get promoted. He took good care of the people who worked for him. You didn't have to worry about that. But Stay away from, if you're the boss in particular, stay away from office politics. Let your people do their jobs. And finally, don't tolerate excuses. The Admiral had a yellowed piece of paper on the inside of his office door. It was called List of Excuses. <laughs> and it was there, of course, so that you better not use one of those. <laughs> or you were in trouble. So the top one was, one I remember the most, is blame your staff. <laughs> uh, that happens so frequently nowadays. No, don't blame anybody. You're the person responsible. Well, Tiff, you spent half your career in the private sector. Were you able to implement these policies in the private sector? Uh, to a degree, yes. All these principles that I just mentioned, I did my best to implement uh, in the projects and uh, jobs that I had. Uh, you can't be perfect. The Admiral had an advantage. It was due to himself that he had the advantage of being able to pick the best people and they had to stay. You were a naval officer for the first four years and they stayed so he could inculcate in them these thoughts. In private industry, you're more subject to your environment. It's rare that you'll find yourself going into an organization that is not already fully staffed. Maybe, as the entrepreneurs did this morning, if you start your own company, you have that benefit. But those of us who tended to work in large organizations, not so much. So you have to Apply the principles and adapt to your environment. You have to, you can't, for example, as I mentioned the other day, uh, you go and see the Admiral 
and <laughs> you were never quite sure whether it would be a civil conversation, if so, it would be very short, or <laughs> whether he'd scream at you, you know, because screaming at you, it wasn't meant personally. Although as a 28-year-old engineer, it was a little hard sometimes not to take it personally, but he didn't mean it that way. It was just the fastest way he could get his message across and get you out of his office and working on the problem so he could deal with the next problem. So you can't really, uh, in my experience, go into industry and start screaming at your subordinates. <laughs> it won't be appreciated and you'll be quickly sidelined by higher level management. So you have to adapt your methods, but the principles, absolutely. Jeff, why don't you explain to this audience a little bit about uh, NR1. Uh, it is a, a special purpose uh, submarine. It turned out to be the longest serving submarine in the history of the US Navy. And uh, you were project officer. What, 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 what was the most important decision that you made in managing that project from start actually to its, uh, to its finish? Um, NR1 was, for those of you who don't know, uh, a deep submergence. It was classified at the time, it no longer is. 3,000, a deep submergence research vehicle that was nuclear powered. It was the world's smallest nuclear submarine. It was about 140 feet long. And it was powered by a reactor, the fuel for which would fit in a wastebasket. Uh, and it lasted 25 years. The fuel did before it was refueled. The purpose of the ship was oceanographic research and intelligence gathering. But it was not a combatant ship. Therefore, it was designed with minimal redundancy. And we weren't sure how it would work out, but if you're going to 3,000 feet, you have to make some compromises uh, with the weight of the ship. So we started out under the assumption that other equipment, equipment for the front end of the ship, it had lights, cameras, three viewports, it had a manipulator, it eventually had a heavy lift capability. It could be towed. Uh, all these things were new, but they weren't new. And that's where the decision came in. Uh, the commercial in people in commercial industry supplied all of this hardware uh, to battery-powered research vehicles. They went as deep at the time as 6,000 feet. So the assumption was initially, well, OK, we'll be able to buy off-the-shelf hardware. Those of you who have designed things know that systems don't generally fail. It's a component that fails in the system. <laughs> That's what gets you in trouble. All systems are made of components. So we were counting on that initially. Very early on, the Admiral realized that, hey, this wasn't true. The reason it wouldn't be true for us is because instead of dipping down into the ocean for a few hours, coming back up and replacing the lights that failed or this that failed, uh, we were going to stay down for weeks at a time with no ability to replace anything outside the ship or basically inside the ship except minor repairs. So we had to have reliability in the components. So what we did is we tested every new component on the ship, which was essentially all of them, for a 1,000 hours and a 1,000 pressure and temperature cycles to test them. Every developmental piece of hardware we had a backup for. What happened in the event was that every component we tested failed. All of the components failed their test. So they had to be either modified or we went to the backup. In the case, for example, the main propulsion motors, they were uh, what's called submersible electric motors. Uh, if you have a well in your, that you get your water from, 
That's a submersible electric motor in the bottom. It operates submerged in water. Our motors were going to be submerged to 3,000 feet. <laughs> and if they failed, then the propulsion plant couldn't operate. Their ship couldn't move. So we had backups. In the long run, that, that to me is a lesson that I've tried to apply to other research and development projects. And you should think about that. Uh, have backups. Do your tests realistically. If you start cutting corners and saying, well, I'm sure this parameter it's good for, what you find is the mix of parameters that you've got uh, are liable to do you in. So as best you can, test realistically. And for, as I say, we did a thousand pressure and temperature cycles, electric boat, uh, who did the ship design, uh, they built a facility, wasn't huge, and we did that for all of them. So that to me was the biggest lesson as far as the design of the ship. And it panned out. It operated reliably for 38 years, which was far beyond what anyone expected. Thanks, Tim. So Jack uh, Cook next. Jack, um, you were part of a large group of experienced officers. I think 700 was the, na the, the number that the Navy selected to operate uh, the expanding fleet of nuclear ships. And the question is, uh, what did the Navy have to do to accomplish this huge conversion from diesel to nuclear? It started out um, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at uh, 1962, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had nine ballistic submarines uh, with short-range Polaris A-1 missiles. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis was in reaction to the fact that we put short-range uh, ICBMs in Italy and, and Turkey. And uh, the Russian responded um, by uh, building a site in uh, Cuba. And we intercepted the ships carrying the missiles uh, in the mid-Atlantic just south of Bermuda. And we said, we're going to turn them around. And they better turn around. We're going to blow them up. So that uh, set a new uh, tenor to the Cold War. And that was before we had decided that the world, the reaction between us and Russia was not going to be first strike, but was going to be mutual assured destruction. So to have mutual assured destruction, we had to have a lot more Polaris missiles than not, Polaris submarines than nine. So we had to accelerate the uh, construction of Polaris submarines from over a 12-year period to a six-year period to conduct, uh, to build 39 additional submarines. So that was a massive, massive industrial mobilization. Uh, some of my classmates who were on attack boats, an electric boat. Uh, they said, Jack, they just put us on one shift. The Polaris's are on three shifts. And so attack boats were getting short shrift on that. The other thing that Admiral Rickover found out is that you can't take a, somebody out of college, take them through nuclear training, and put them to sea as a sailor. There's something about taking ships to sea that take experience and also leading men at sea that takes more experience than a college education. So um, the Bureau of Personnel in 1962 had an IBM card sorter that was built in 1938. So the Admiral's uh, personnel characteristics went in, and so the people at Buper stuck pins in the cod sort of machinery and out popped about 1,000 cards. And these were printed out as the records, and these went over to NR, and NR uh, uh, looked through them, and they think of about 768 people popped out. And I had command of a salvage tugboat. 
stationed in Yokosuka, Japan. And I got a, a, a message from uh, Buper saying, uh, you're invited to be interviewed for nuclear power. And I wrote back, I refused the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my admiral, who was uh, down in Sasebo, picked up the telephone and said, that's not an invitation, Jack. That's a command. Get your ass to Washington. <laughs> So I came uh, in midsummer uh, 1964. It was hot as hell. At that time, NR was in the temporaries that were on the mall that were built in World War II. One, one, no, built World War One. No, he, we were in the N building, which yeah, was behind. Yeah, and that was right at the end of the 17th one, Street, one. and the admiral's office was on the third floor, looking out over the mall. And I got up there, it was hot as hell. And there was a long hall with um, chairs in it and about 20 people looking scared, and we all were. And these imposing lieutenant commanders and commanders who each took us and briefed us as what to expect. And we were told, answer only the question. Don't volunteer anything. So I got conducted in, I sat in the famous chair that slipped, I was told about it, and I didn't slip out of it. Ad Admiral asked me two questions, I answered them, he said, get out. <laughs> and um, I won't tell you what the two questions, because I don't know how many he asked the other ones, but two hours later, I was told to go over to Bupe Purse and determine whether I wanted to spend the rest of my life uh, grooming carrier aircraft ca uh, plants, uh, nuclear plants, or be a submariner. So I volunteered for submarines. And that was that part of it. And Peter's going to talk about the training. And the training was, I, t I just completed my master's in electrical engineering. I looked at the syllabus. I says, I've done this already. But the way the Admiral trained us for a year in nuclear power school in the prototype uh, was very unique, very arduous, and I found out that I really didn't know everything that I thought I knew. But right in the middle of my period at Bainbridge, the Admiral came up uh, to Bainbridge and got all the instructors together, and this was 64, and said, we've got a problem. The people who are doing well at nuclear school are not doing so well at the prototype. Now, why the hell is that doing? Actually, he started it his usual way. God damn it. <laughs> that was his usual way to start a meeting in which he was going to chew somebody out. <clears throat> so, uh, silence in the room. Then a instructor, and we had really great instructors, and you know why? It's because they were exempt from the draft. So if you got to be chosen as an instructor at nuclear power school, as long as you were a good instructor, you weren't going to go to Vietnam in the draft. Admiral, I know why. Well, what is it? He said, we use multiple choice chess. We're selecting people who can guess right. At the prototype, you got to do right. And the tests that they give at the prototype are written tests, and you have to have the right answer and there's no credit for technique. Two days without classes, then school began. And it was from then on out, it was all objective testing without credit or method. We lost three guys in the first week. So that's it. Now, let me go to the technical side. We have had 64 years of operations in nuclear power plants. We mentioned this yesterday. 36 out of them without the Admiral, effectively. And guess what? The result is that right now, we have 2,000 long-range Trident missiles at sea at all times. That is the basis of our defense against 
<laughs> what we've always thought was our common enemy, which was Russia. And that's a hell of a legacy of destruction. Now today, what I saw today, listening to uh, especially this last uh, uh, entrepreneurial things, is that probably the Admiral's greatest legacy is going to be you guys. He's always knew that you needed people with brains. And um, you've got the brains and you've got the will. Between 1964 and today, 70% of the jobs that are active today didn't exist in 1964. And I, I guess it was, who is it? Judd and, and uh, Mr. Sabar, they and uh, uh, Ms. Belkhajian, is that it? And uh, Dr. Kim, they're inventing jobs. Now to the other thing that Bill mentioned, I finished my command tour on Woodrow Wilson, um, and Woodrow Wilson was going into the, the uh, uh, yard for Poseidon conversion. Um, so I was going to go to Washington. So I said to myself, what have I done in the last nine years in the nuclear Navy that was really fun? And it's working with people, creating teams, and then working with their families in the off crew. So I said, how can I continue to do that? And I said, in medicine. So it turns out that Yale's like nuclear submariners. There's a nuke in the class before me, and as far as I know, there was a nuke in the three classes after us. And so I went to medical school, and now I have repurposed and am in the water business. <laughs> so good luck. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. So Mario, uh, among our four panelists, you've had the broadest exposure to the Navy and its way of doing business. What did you take away from working with the Admiral? I just would like to, let's see if I get this better. Pull it out. One of the things about the success of the nuclear power program yeah. that I wanted to add on to what you just said is when we had the, in 1979, we had a Three Mile Island accident. And one of the proud newspapers in Hawaii said, thank God we don't have any nuclear reactors in Hawaii. In the meantime, <laughs> out in the harbor, there was about eight submarines, all <laughs> nuclear powered. We kept the nuclear power program low key, and he did many things to keep us out of political trouble in operations and everything else. Uh, that's not what you asked the question about, but I wanted to add that. So I always thought that was pretty funny. Uh, what I learned from Admiral Rickover I learned a lot of interesting things, but you know, you call him a great manager, but he was also a good leader. Good leaders have to be managers, but they have to have a lot of other uh, capabilities. Uh, and he criticized the civil service quite a bit, except his own. I mean, he had a talent people, but I had experiences in the Department of Energy and also uh, most recently in the Army. And a lot of people don't want to stand up and be responsible for their jobs. That's one of the things you've already heard once or twice. Being responsible, you are in charge. Well, I took that seriously all the time. Even when I was a political, I got in trouble for it, but what the heck. They put me in the job, I'm going to be in charge till they fire me. And one of the things that he promoted all the time to his own staff is don't worry about your next job. Do this job right in the first place. And I've taken that through all my career. And being responsible, I had a uh, experience where a contemporary of mine in the Department of Energy, I used to call him Mr. Teflon. Whenever something went wrong, somebody else got blamed for it, even though he's the guy in charge. I'm dead wrong, I mean, that would not be Rick Over's way at all. If you're gonna be in charge, you're gonna be responsible and you take the heat when you screw up. And I practiced that clearly when I had a DOE facility and a nuclear weapons facility. 
Uh, the other thing that, that the leadership doesn't understand, that you really have to be worried about the details. You can't just blow away and, you know, I'm in charge, Joe Blow, you do this and you do that. You got to know what the details are. And I'm a Rick Over, who a lot of people don't realize that a lot of things he didn't know about nuclear power, but he had trusted people that did and kept him out of trouble, and he made sure they kept him out of trouble. But knowing details, Admiral Rickover used to require all the submarine skippers to write letters to him, either quarterly when you're operating, every two weeks while you're in the shipyard. And he had a lot of other people at the shipyards particularly. And if you didn't confess your sins that two week period, he'd give you a call. And if you had too many calls, you probably were in trouble. Uh, again, understanding the uh, details of the job. I had a, a young man working for me, of course, I had a bunch of SESs working for me at one point. And, you know, you're talking about a lot of Uncle Sam's money being spent. And what they call him was the snitch, of all things. He was my information source. I couldn't trust my senior people to always tell me something they didn't want me to know because I'd interfere with their job. These things Rickover would have never tolerated. He wanted to know what was going on. And he had loyal people working for him, and they did keep him informed. Every now and then, I have a couple of documents from the 60s and 70s where a couple of his own shipyard representatives that worked for him, he gave him a lecture, a three-page lecture, on, written down, by the way, what they should not do. They should not take his job because he is the guy in charge. They're not supposed to be friends with the contractor. Well, when I was at Savannah Riverside, I clearly was not the friend of the contractor. I mean, I practiced that more than anything else. But my people always kept me informed, and that's exactly what I got from him. Uh, obviously, a lot of hard work is required when people work there. But another thing that he did he checked up on people. Part of this is checking up on the letters. If he would get a letter from the shipyard commanding officer and he didn't know about it, the first guy he goes to is his, represent his own representative. Why didn't you tell me? <coughs> and if you dare say, well, I didn't think it was important enough, oh my God, you'd be in trouble. I mean, you had to pay attention to him. Uh, so that's sort of the things I learned. I don't think Department of Energy is my experience with the civil service where I had 600 employees and about 24,000 contract employees. And they just spent money like there was no tomorrow. And one of my favorite things I tell people when I talk about civil service is they can do a good job. You just got to make sure that they're inspired to do the job. We saved all sorts of money by just eliminating stupid things that have been going on for 20 years. I think I'm a Rick Over would have been proud to see the things I eliminated. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. I had a fleet of something like 8,000 cars, all about 10 years old. All sorts of maintenance headaches, environmental headaches. So I gave it to GSA, and I got a new fleet of cars, 2,000 of them, which was way too many. Uh, but there are ways to save money, and that's things that I picked up from how I had my Rick Over worked. So, that's a starting point. Well, thanks a lot, Mario. Uh, yeah. Peter, finally, uh, you were involved in many projects for the Admiral, spent a lot of time with him one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, what can you say about the whole man? His empathy, his breadth of interest, his sense of humor. What was the guy like? Uh, very different than uh, most people ever portrayed him. Um, the, the skill of empathy, uh, classic definition, is putting yourself in another person's shoes and being able then to um, operate like that person. Rickover was the most skilled executor of empathy of anybody I've ever known in my entire lifetime. I'll give you an example of that, uh, what, how empathy worked for him. He and I were returning from a sea trial in, uh, out of the Mare Island in, in the Bay, San Francisco Bay, 
and we had a stopover at the Navy uh, base on Treasure Island. And when we arrived there, the Admiral said to me, have you ever been on a minesweeper? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, there's a two divisions stationed here. Let's go see if we can tour, tour one of them. And I said, fine, let's go. And uh, as you may or may not have heard, we never wore uniforms. Uh, that partly was because Eisenhower outlawed him in Washington, D.C., because he thought that Washington, D.C. looked like a military base. Um, so we walked down the, the pier to one of these um, minesweepers, and there was a seaman there standing guard at the gangway. And the admiral said to him, uh, we're two doctors here for the convention. He'd seen on the board at the officers club that they were having a convention of doctors. He said, and we haven't been aboard a ship, and uh, could you give us a tour? Now, to set the stage, uh, you should know that in World War II, the admiral was uh, a, a captain at the time, but had the responsibility for all the ships on the West Coast to inspect a ship damaged in war and decide, should it be scrapped or should it be repaired? So the kid said, yeah, well, I can give you a tour, but I got to go down and get relieved. He got relieved. Turned out that he had, uh, was two weeks out of boot camp out of basic training and had been assigned to this minesweeper. We spent two hours wandering around that minesweeper. The admiral never asked him a question he could not answer. That to me is the height of empathy. The other thing that the admiral was, people don't know about, was his breadth of interests. Uh, I was part of a crew quiz team that operated in uh, uh, Road to Spain, uh, we were there for five days um, interviewing crews from the Polaris ships that were in and out of Road to Spain. The Admiral came over for the closing discussions, and after they were over, he said to the five of us, I'm going to take you guys on two days of vacation, which knocked us down. We'd never heard of words like that out of the Admiral's mouth. Anyway, we, we drove first to the Roman Colosseum in Sevilla, Spain. It's the only intact Colosseum, Roman Colosseum, outside of Italy. As you drive up the sign, big signs that say, Americans, Brits, and Australians get an English-speaking guide. So I said to the Admiral, should we get a guide? He said, no, no. He said, I speak Spanish. OK. So we go in there and get this guide, and the guide is taking us around the thing and making statements in Spanish. And the Admiral is translating for us, and we're going on. We get up on top of the Colosseum. We're looking down into the Colosseum. And the guide says something. And Admiral says, no! And then back at him in Spanish. And, uh, and he said, turns to us and says, we got to go down to the, to the uh, control office down there. So we go down, and the Admiral and the guide go in. We're standing there you know, wondering, what the heck is going on? And uh, out the, the two of them come. The guide has a frown on his face, and the admiral has a big grin. And so we go on with the tour and finish the tour. And finally, then, when it's over, we ask the admiral, what was that all about? He said, for 21 years, this guy has been telling the people he's been guiding that Hannibal was killed here. He wasn't killed here. He was just defeated and driven back to Africa. He said, I had to fix that. Uh, the last thing I want to comment about uh, Rick over is uh, um, his sense of humor. Um, uh, Tip and I and our wives at the time were uh, standing at a cocktail party with another couple. This was a cocktail party that NR had organized, and the Admiral had been invited. But we were unclear whether he would come. Uh, in fact, he was one of the first people there, and he was absolutely the last person to leave. But anyway, Tip and I and this other couple were standing in a little circle talking. And all of a sudden, we realized that the Admiral was in our circle. And um, you may not know, the Admiral was fairly restricted in stature. So it was easy for him to get into this group of taller people and not be noticed. Well, we immediately introduced our wives to the Admiral. And after some chit chat, my wife said to the Admiral, um, Admiral, Peter really loves working for you. And the Admiral said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, you know, he gets there at 7 in the morning. He leaves at 6 at night. 
and sometimes he goes in on Saturdays. And the animal says, yeah, but he goes home at night. Uh, <laughs> the other um, hum humorous example is that whenever the Admiral was someplace where he was going to be overnight, the commanding officer of that facility tried to prepare himself to have the right food and the right reading material for the Admiral. Well, the Admiral quickly realized that there was a list circulating among commanding officers as what were the foods and reading materials that the Admiral liked. And guess what? From that point on, he never asked for the same thing again. <laughs> he was always asking for some new food or some um, different reading material to get that they, they had accumulated all this stuff, and he was always asking for something new. So I, um, one of the questions that you've asked all people is the, the, can you implement the Rickover strategy, the Rickover philosophy, wherever you go? And the answer is not only yes, it is hell yes, you can. And you do it by example. You don't have to do it by yelling and screaming at people, but the way you operate and how you perform, as I said er in a session earlier today, will create that image in the people that you're working with. And I'll just give you one little example from my experience. I, I joined a construction company as the chief operating officer. And th they w obviously were selling their services to fairly sophisticated clients. But nobody wore coats and ties in this company. Large company, ultimately ended up with a couple of billion dollars worth of sales. So I started wearing a suit. And it was amazing how quickly, I never said anything to anybody, how quickly the whole operation that had any interface with the public started wearing suits. So by your example, you can implement Rick Over's strategy. Thanks, Peter. Well, we thought that uh, you records might have some questions to ask us, so I'd like to open this for a Q&A. Hope you could come down and ask questions that you might want us to answer about the Admiral. Yeah, please, come down. We've, we've, got, we've, got, we've got Rickover stories. We could spend the entire afternoon here telling Rickover stories, so please and let, us, let us start. Let your piece on. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. It's there. Yeah, I had a, a what-if question. So if uh, Admiral Rickover was, say, a young person today graduating, would he be attracted to go into the U.S. Navy again and to kind of strategize and think about the future of kind of the military, or would he be more attractive to go to, say, a startup company or a big company in the civil, civilian domain? What do you think Admiral Rickover would be doing if he were alive today as a young man? Who, uh, who wants to take that on? Peter, you knew, you yeah, know the Admiral. I'll, I'll, I'll try it. I, uh, I believe that it, if, for example, n nuclear energy did not exist when he, as, at, at this point, that um, he, he would make a decision to go into the, the most difficult technology he could find. And, and whether that's uh, you know, artificial intelligence or that, that he would choose that because he was always trying to improve and better himself um, in, in, uh, in everything he did. Well, the AI is important for the Navy nowadays, too. Well, yes, no, no, I, I agree. But I would think, given today's situation, he, I mean, you'll find, many people will find this hard to believe. Nuclear power is one of the simplest energy technologies there is, and yet, and so he would be more stimulated by uh, the, the higher technology demanding fields, in my opinion. One of the, thi one of the things that Admiral Rickover did that always caught my eye, is he had command of a gunboat on the Yangtze River for 40 days. And uh, he was regular Navy. And um, if anybody here is a student of Pearl Buck, uh, it's a wonder thing to see uh, stories of the gunboat on the, the Yangtze River. 
I just give you one other little piece of data about Rick. Rick was a graduate of the Naval Academy, class of 1922. Uh, the Naval Academy publishes a yearbook. Rick Overs' page in that yearbook was perforated so it could be torn out if you didn't want to have a Jewish member of your class in your yearbook. So he, over had, he had a lot to overcome in his career. And another thing that he did, uh, my grandfather was a Westinghouse engineer. And he told about this guy from the Navy who insisted that circuit breakers be placed in all naval ships instead of knife switches. And Rickover invented the uh, shockproof uh, uh, circuit breaker boards using uh, uh, Westinghouse circuit breakers. And it made a big difference in the destroyers and cruisers in World War II. So he was a man of engineering competence as well as leadership competence. Yeah, we have a question from the floor here, please. Thank you. Um, so just, I was very amazed to hear about the Rickover model in the nuclear navies, but um, just to think about how would you suppose, um, given its success, how, how, do, how would you like to see the same Rickover model or the same style of leadership be, be implemented in other aspects of the public sector, um, particularly you know, uh, to increase people's confidence in the public system and um, other aspects of, of the government. Thank you. So, Tim. Go, uh, go ahead, Tim. One thing the Admiral said often was that he would be happy to do exactly what you're saying and train other people in government to operate with the same, the same way he did with hopefully the same degree of success. And the problem was no one ever asked, literally. <laughs> Uh, but it could be. You do need certain type of person to be able to implement it. You won't be able to take your average bureaucrat and expect them to do this unless maybe you train them from the beginning. So it can be done. People are reluctant to do it. I mentioned the other day the average length of time that a political appointee is in office is, yes. 17 months. 17 months. You don't build an organization in 17 months. You just are, you're there long enough to fool the Congress into thinking you've done something before you move on to your next job. So it's, it's more than the person. It's a whole way of looking at uh, the government as a career as opposed to a bunch of stepping stones. Yeah, I'd just add one thing to that. One of the things that I believe is that if, if an organization is operated like Rickover operated, the people underneath him will find the job much more exciting and much more enjoyable because he will call upon their innate capabilities, which oftentimes are not looked on upon at all. Yes, over here. Hi, so I'm wondering about speaking the truth and why it is that we uh, are looking back today on Admiral Rickover's um, way of speaking and his mannerisms and, ha and the high standards that he held people accountable to and why we laugh when we think of acting that way again, um, of someone acting that way today, right? Like you say, like ah, you know, we wouldn't want to, you know, uh, treat your subordinates that way in these days, you know, haha, -ha, you'd be, um, you'd be, escorted out quickly, right? So what's, like, I feel like there's a disconnect here. On one hand, yesterday, um, and today also. Um, our distinguished guests, including some of you all, were saying that there just hasn't been anyone like the Admiral since then. And I'm trying to understand, is it because, um, is it like something about what's, you know, like maybe there is a, oh, maybe something about his way of doing things that we shouldn't be trying to replicate? Or is it that none of us has, have had the guts to know when it was the right time to say, God damn it, 
this is a problem? Like, is, is it that we need to be finding our confidence to be, you know, to know when the right moment is to really hold people accountable and then to go full force? Or is it that, um, that there was something that, you know, would be socially looked down on and he happened to be high enough power to get away with it? Sorry if that is a horrible question to ask, but I've, it's been burning at me for two days now. Uh, in the past 20 years, I guess, also. I think, yeah. <laughs> Tip, give it a shot. Um, I probably didn't make myself clear. What I meant is to say is the Admiral's methods and his way of dealing with us who were on his staff worked fine. But if you go into a private enterprise, an existing organization, and uh, scream at your subordinates, as he occasionally did, not all the time, but he occasionally did, uh, you'd probably be in trouble. That's really not what's important here. What's important is taking responsibility for your actions. And the answer to your question is always now. Now is the time to speak truth to power, if you will. Now is the time to be honest. Don't wait until you're in a position of power when you think, oh, I'll do it then. It's like presidents. You know, some, some argue that the president has to wait for his second term so he has nothing to lose. And then he'll do all the things that he promised. Never happens. People who develop a habit of a lifetime, they don't change it the last four years they're in office. So start now, do it now. You don't have to scream at people. That was just a little aside, but. Yeah, I, I, I would add to that. I've, I, don't, I can't quickly count the number of organizations I've been in, but it's at least four or five or six as a senior executive. You can implement the Rickover principles. You don't have to scream, although I've been in some situations where that was the only way to get the attention of the people but it is how you operate and the integrity of your leadership that allows you to then scream at them and still think you're doing a good job. Sure, another question over here. Yes, thank you. Um, I actually had a question very similar to the one that was just asked, but I'll modify a little bit since you did basically ask, answer that question. The, so you know, we're being told, and I think it's absolutely true when you look at the, the accomplishments and the impact that the Admiral has had, uh, that he was a great leader and, and uh, incredibly intelligent, did a lot of great things. One tends to look at somebody like that as a model, and, or you know, somebody you can look up to, somebody you can try to learn things from. The stories we hear aren't necessarily the things we would want to repeat. Um, and you know, we hear them, and they're entertaining or whatever. But you know, and you know, certainly be empathetic is a you know is a is a good lesson. You know, speak truth, uh, hold people responsible for their actions, that sort of thing. Those are all great lessons. But and we can hear those things. But at the same time, we also hear about the chair and like you know, always asking for different kind of food and stuff like that. And it's kind of funny, but. It's also something where it's kind of hard to reconcile in my mind. He was the most empathetic person I've ever met, and he was also trained to, to you know, get people and make them feel uncomfortable in you know, the discomfort zone that we heard yesterday. How do we reconcile those things? I, I easily reconcile them. What, his, his role in the interview process was to get each of us, as we are interviewed, to get beyond our false mask and to see what we really are made of. That's what he was looking for. And that was his role in the interview process. Also, I think, I, I don't want to paint the Admiral as a god. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't a god. And sometimes he did things which he probably regretted himself in the instance of the moment. But what he was trying to do always was sort of keep the mission in mind, you know. What we were dealing with for the operating forces uh, could mean the difference between life or death at, at certain moments. We had to get it right. So if he got angry at someone because they weren't getting it right, we got him a little slack. But same said, no one's perfect. He wasn't either. All right, thank you. Yeah, let, let, let me. Let me add my two cents worth as a moderator, since I was there too. 
I don't think any of us are trying to tell you to be like the Admiral. I think what we're telling you is to try and understand what the Admiral was expecting of us. Don't try to, don't try to be like him, okay? He, he, I agree. I don't know anybody that could ever aspire to be like the Admiral. That's not going to happen. But listen to the lessons. Listen to what Rick Over preached. That's the important thing. Yes? Well, could I add something oh, to sure. that, actually? Oh, please, yeah. You know, I didn't know the Admiral very well. Uh, as a naval officer, you know him because he yells at you, or if you did something wrong, or you reported something, and all that. But I got to know him much more after he created the Rickover Institute. And, you know, if, if, if we look at his whole life, the successes in the Navy, the successes in all the other things that he's done in the Navy. I mean, the Navy didn't like him. You gotta realize that. Uh, the admirals were living in the past, in the early 50s. And he was the one that pushed nuclear power. He's the one that pushed innovative new nuclear technologies. He had more courage than anybody else to do these things and take chances. Some worked, some didn't. And one of his, themes that he always put out is the fact that, hey, if it doesn't work, back off, fix it, and go on to the next thing. So he did lots of those. But I think for you all to, to inherit the Rickover Institute and the CEE, I think if he had anything to say about it now, I think this would be one of his greatest accomplishments. I really do. I was with uh, Joanne and him in the beginning. And I actually attended a bunch of sessions with the young people in 83, I think, out in Xerox. And he cares about America. And there's lots of things. He created a great nuclear power program, and it's still working today. And you've heard, he's been gone 36 years, whatever it is, and it's still working very, very well. That's the important things to learn, that he was dedicated to one thing, he wasn't out to make money. He was dedicated to government service. And unfortunately, my experience in the government service is not that many people are that dedicated to go for 20 or 30 years and drive a problem to completion. And I think those are the type of things I'd like people to remember about the man. He's also a gifted intellect. I mean, we don't talk about his intellectual ability as much. But I hope you by all the things you've heard, that he is an intellect. He could speak Latin. And he was a studier of the classics. And he could quote poetry that I never even heard of. I should have heard of it when I was younger, but I didn't. <laughs> and those are all other characteristics of the man. I mean, he is a multifaceted person. And can we all be like him? Heck no. Right? Do you all want to be like him? Probably not in some areas. But I sure want it is intellect and certainly his way of doing business for the proper way to go. I'm sorry I'm preaching. No, we're here to preach, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Admiral Rickover had a, also had a huge imp impact on um, civilian nuclear power. And uh, right now as a country, we're, we're eagerly trying to find clean sources of energy and nuclear power is one of those considered. One, something that's always, in my um, experience, held back civilian nuclear power is what, what do you do with the waste? Economically, technically, and politically, how can you take care of that long-term problem with the waste from civilian nuclear power? So are there any insights from, do you think, from Admiral Rickover or you know, how he and his team operated that could be you know, you know, usefully applied to solving that issue that hasn't been solved? I think. Maybe not easily, but maybe applied. A tip, take it. Uh, what most people don't realize is the way to deal with nuclear waste was solved in the 60s. Uh, the way to deal with nuclear waste, in my opinion, and this was the plan at the time, was to reprocess the nuclear fuel, remove the long-lived isotopes, mainly plutonium-239, and make new fuel from it. That is done to a small degree in France and Russia and Japan has now started reprocessing. Um, politically, however, that's difficult because if you reprocess, 
not only do you reduce the half-life from, what's the half-life of a PU-239? Uh, 150,000 years more, I think, to about 30 years. You also make nuclear power much more attractive because you're using a couple of hundred times as much energy from a pound of, blue, of uranium. So if you don't want nuclear power, you don't want reprocessing. So it's been a continuous political battle uh, within the Congress. I mean, I once told that to a Senate committee to which I was testifying about a program that would do just that, that the people who oppose nuclear power, who were literally whispering in the senator's ear at the time, uh, they didn't want this. They were trying to kill this program. And the program survived, at least for the year I was in the job. And so you have to look at these things as a holistic problem. And the biggest part of the waste problem is political. Uh, so by the way, in case you're worried, our nuclear waste is stored safely on site at nuclear power plants and casks that are good for at least 100 years. And hopefully in a, a less than 100 years, we'll solve the political problem. Well, an important thing to remember about nuclear waste it is minuscule in comparison to all the other waste from other power sources, except obviously the wind power and solar. Uh, people forget that. You could almost fill maybe two baseball fields about 50 feet high, and that's about the waste. You know, that's one day's worth, worth of waste from New York City into their dumps. Uh, we make it a big issue. We have the technology to safely take care of it. Politically, it was very difficult. Uh, the, we have two places where we're putting one place uh, in, where's WIPC? Uh, New Mexico. In New Mexico, we have a deep thousand foot mine. Uh, we had some incident recently because the operators weren't operating properly and not doing their homework properly, which is a fault of part of our civilian training. I don't think if we had all the Navy guys down there, that would have happened, by the way. That's a prejudice. Uh, and then we have Yucca Mountain, which a senator, for political reasons, has killed all these years. Yucca Mountain, I call it a gold mine in the sky, because we spent so much money on it. And it would be a very safe place, and most people would argue that it is. And we could take all these uh, fuel rods uh, that were not reprocessing, which I think is the wrong way to go. We should have been. But that was done by uh, President Carter. Uh, and there's another reason for it, by the way. It wasn't necessarily economical to do at the time. And so put them into Yucca Mountain, a safe place. We have other places in the country we're looking at to dispose of the waste. But the waste issue is overblown. It is a political problem. And that's where we have to educate our p politicians to understand that this is probably a smart, safe way to go. Plus, nuclear power is proven to be the most safe thing we have. We kill more people. In the other industries than we do in nuclear power. We haven't killed anybody except an accident in the very beginning of the power, and it wasn't nuclear power, it was experimental power. So that's a long time ago. And you should recognize that other countries in the world are storing nuclear waste yeah. safely and reliably. Yes. So this question is really more to Dr. Cook, but of course other people are welcome to weigh in. Um, a couple of the Rickoids and I were discussing earlier about applying the uh, zero faults model, and we discuss and we were thinking that perhaps medicine would be one of the places where a zero faults model would be extremely desirable. Do you have any comments on applying the Rickover way of thinking to the practice of medicine? Well, it's <coughs> every uh, medicine has changed, of course, but it is advancing so rapidly uh, that. The idea of a, a doctor standing alone has gone. It's been gone for about 10 years. Everything's in teams. I started out um, uh, running intensive care unit for 17 years. Uh, 
And that definitely is a team sport because that's 24 seven uh, because patients don't wait. I went from there to geriatrics because I are one. And, <laughs> and what I found is that geriatrics is a team sport because there's two phases of it. One is prevention, which is the most important part. And that's done by a very skilled team on a scheduled basis. Then the other one is acute care. Somebody's sick, and, but one person can't take care of a sick person that's taken care of by a team, whether it's in the office or the emergency room. Now, that's the, that's the final product. How do you get the team? Well, you get the team by a myriad of sources, and what you have to do is when you bring them in, you have to see what they can do and then fix them so they can work with you. And as we get more and more into, uh, there's actually the American College of Physicians has a program called Choosing Wisely, and that's what, where we're going to. I would say uh, since nuclear power is structural and mechanical in many aspects, the problems in uh, medicine is about two orders of magnitude worse, but it's all teamwork and it's all personal responsibility. Does that help? Great, thank you. Okay. Yes, we have another question. Do you have time for one last one? Yeah, one last one. Yes, please. Um, this is a rather short question. Um, did you ever worry about radiation when you were working on these nuclear reactors? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Short answer. I mean, yeah. Yeah. after the Three Mile Island accident, the uh -huh. utility yeah. that ran the Three Mile Island happened to be a client of the company I was working with. In fact, uh, we were building another power plant for them. So we ended up, since they ran out of cash, we ended up at Three Mile Island. So I was there for several weeks. Right after the accident, we were working basically a 24-hour day engineering service, building backup systems. We were about 100 meters or less from the containment building. We all had film badges. When I left the site several weeks later, there was no radiation at all. And frankly, it wasn't a concern because Anyone's been in this field and visited lots of facilities. And the protections, thanks to what was instituted by the Admiral and the early people at Naval Reactors, the protections are quite adequate. Yeah, I'll give you a simple little thing that uh, spending the night naked next to a nuclear power plant, you get less radiation than spending a night naked to another human being. That's a, that's a, that's well, a fact. That's that, a fact. It's not necessarily recommended. No. <laughs> not as much fun. Thank you. Thank you. So let me just I, wrap I, up. I'd like to thank my panel. I'd like to thank you for listening. I would just like to add one thing. I was going to use that line. The Admiral was also a philosopher. The Admiral liked to think a lot about how to lead a meaningful life. In fact, I think underlying his whole personality was how do, how do you leave a meaningful, how do you lead a meaningful life, leave a meaningful reputation? And I'd just like to read a quote from the Admiral. Uh, he gave a long speech at one point about, about how to achieve a meaningful life. And he said, uh, and I quote here from him, with regard to the, the, the purpose of life. Uh, to seek and accept responsibility, to persevere, to be committed to excellence, to be creative and courageous, to be unrelenting in the pursuit of intellectual development, to maintain high standards of ethics and morality, and to bring these basic principles of existence to bear throughout our active participation in life. And I hope you records go out and do just that. Thank you. Here, here.
I hope it's giving you um, a, a new perspective on the life of Admiral Rickover. He would be proud today. Um, before I dismiss you for the CEE talks, you were talking about Admiral Rickover's sense of humor. And indeed, you hear about his screaming, you hear all these things about interviews. The greatest humorous um, situation that one of them that I was ever in with the Admiral, and there were several, was when we had just finished lunch with President Nixon in New York, and he believed that even though he was a very flawed president, he, his mentality was superior to many of the other presidents. And President Nixon, of course, and he, they were discussing their legacies and President Nixon said, it doesn't matter what I did for Title IX for women. It doesn't matter that I started the EPA. What people are going to remember about me is Watergate. And Admiral said, my fear is that I will be remembered for taking gifts from Westinghouse because people tend to remember the bad things about what people do. And he had been very upset. Haynes Johnson in the Washington Post had said he was not a good role model for youth. Uh, Dan Rather had said some horrible things. And we were all quite upset. But um, then they said, well, we tried to do our best. That's the sad part of the conversation. Admiral and I then were leaving the apartment. <clears throat> and Admiral said, Joanne, um, how will I be remembered? And I had waved down a taxi. And the taxi stops. The man jumps out. He opens the door. And he said, oh, I can't believe I'm meeting you what you've done for our country. It's such an honor to speak with you. And Admiral punched me in the side and smiled. <laughs> we got into the taxi, and he had a grin the whole way back to the hotel. As we're getting out of the taxi, the driver opened the door and said, General Rickenbacker, this is my greatest honor. And Admiral turned to him, and he said, you dumb son of a bitch. <laughs> TED Talks, the CEE Talks, immediately start. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. All right?